Jackson, Tennessee. I'm Pastor Bill Schultz. Going to give you a nice message today. Hungry Hearts Ministries is a Torah observant, uh, spirit filled uh, ministry with the use of certain Hebrew worship tools like the Talit and the Shofar. Uh, we believe in keeping all of God's laws and commandments. We have accepted Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ, say, uh, sacrifice for our sins. And because of that, we owe him our obedience. We're filled with his spirit. We worship him with it. Today, I'm going to talk about something that's pertinent to the news that's going on. So here today, in the, the end of October 2023, there has been a horrific a terrorist attack in the nation of Israel. And there's a big debate raging over whether we should support the Palestinians or whether we should support the Israelis. And frankly, I am shocked and appalled at the Christians who were taking the side of the Palestinians. Don't turn it off yet. Don't turn it off yet. Today's message is Jesus is Jewish. I think a lot of people have forgotten that our Savior is Jewish. Over the years, starting with when I became uh, a Sabbath keeper, a lot of people have challenged me. Oh, you're just being Jewish. Okay, what is it about being Jewish that the devil hates so bad that every time you take a step closer to God, you're accused of being Jewish? And then the more you look into it, the more you say, okay, uh, it's in the Bible. So, you know, even a few years ago when we first started doing some Hebrew prayers, a guy gave me a book about Judaism. And I, I thought to myself, you know, no one ever bothers to look and see. Someone just says something and everybody runs with it. Now, my great-grandfather was a horse trader. So there's a saying in the family, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Okay, so... People would rather argue about whether it's okay or it's not okay, and they have all their opinions, but no one ever bothers to walk across the street and take a look and see. Now, fortunately, we met in the basement of a Jewish temple for 21 years. So I went last night to show my support, not just for Israel, not just over this attack, but to my Jewish friends who are now all of a sudden an object of vitriol and I don't even understand why they're some of the nicest people I know so what is so bad with Judaism well okay there's a little dispute over Jesus I got that but when you go to the temple they don't bring that up to you they run their service we run our service you know now we're gonna go through some verses Jesus did not just choose to be born a Jew he chose to be a rabbi we overlook that. There's a lot of people think Jesus came to start a new religion. He came to clean up the one he already gave them. And yet here we are in Christianity with a religion that looks totally different. Are we sure we're right? So many times I'm asked about the Jewish roots of the Christian faith or I'm asked why we use things like this Jewish talit. People talk about this ministry being too far out there, way too far out there. And when they do, it's always about that Jewish stuff. So I've noticed over the years the devil has always attacked me and hungry hearts about the Jewish stuff. Well, sometimes people think I'm foolhardy. It doesn't matter that I studied these things for a long time. I'm not really foolhardy. I didn't make any move in this ministry from the adoption of this Talit without doing a little work on it, okay? Frankly, I'm often compared to the Apostle Peter. I personally think Peter gets a bad rap. Okay? Eleven of them were too timid to get out of the boat. So why does Peter get the bad rap for believing what he was told? You see... The man that, that saved me, the man that led me to Jesus, used to say this all the time. It's not enough to believe on God or to believe about God. You have to believe God. Jesus said certain things and you have to take them at face value. and You have to believe what he said, not twist them around to what you want it to be. So even the devils believe, as James says, that there is one God and they shudder. But they don't believe God, or else they'd still be loyal angels. We've got to believe him. He says Saturday's the Sabbath. We have to believe him. He chose to be a Jewish rabbi. 
That should make everybody stop and pause before you say something ugly about Jewish people. Your Savior is a Jew. What are you going to do? Tell him no? Really, are you going to tell him no? Let me tell you something else. Nobody else would have done it for you. No other, no other family on earth would have done what Jesus did for you. It's only because he's Jewish. Or should I say, it, he chose to be Jewish because only that family. And it goes all the way back. It goes all the way back to Genesis and the prophecy that Jacob gave his son Judah. But I digress. Well, let's get on to it. <clears throat> We're going to start in Deuteronomy 18. Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe him? It's not enough to believe about him. Because, you know, a lot of churches have a gospel about Jesus. We try to hold to the gospel Jesus preached. What's that? That the kingdom of God is coming. Well, that's why we keep all the laws and commandments, because they're the laws and commandments of his kingdom. That's why we use some Hebrew prayers, because Hebrew is going to be the language of the kingdom. That's why we keep the holy days. These are the holy days of the kingdom. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Lord your, Moses speaking, the Lord your God is, is going to raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him. So Moses is telling you a prophet's going to come. That's why they kept asking Jesus, are you the prophet? You, you ever, ever wonder about that when they ask him that? And the Pharisees kept saying, are you the prophet? They asked John the Baptist the same thing. Are you the prophet? See, it's, they weren't asking him if he was a prophet like Isaiah or Jeremiah. They are asking if he's this prophet. That's why when he kept saying son of man, they're freaking out, right? Because they knew the prophecy in Daniel that the son of man was going to be given the kingdom. So he kept saying, I'm the son of man, and they're freaking out. Are you the son of man? You can't say that. That's You follow where I'm going. I mean, this is all well-known stuff. For this is what you ask of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see his fire anymore, lest we die. Are you sure I'm in the right place here? I'm kind of, there we go. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth. Isn't that what Jesus said? I only speak the words the Father gives me, right? And he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him into account. So Jesus quotes this passage concerning himself every time he was asked who he was. I speak only the words the Father gives me. See what I'm saying? So Jesus is, is, is fulfilling this prophecy we better put Jesus first in our focus because the Father is going to call us into account over the, his words and teachings that he gave Jesus. When Jesus moves us to act, it's not being rash to move on. When he says, I want the prayers, it's not rash to learn them enough to say them. When he says, I want you to keep my Sabbath and holy days, which hey, most of us did when we first got saved, amen. Way back in the day when we first found out about Sabbath a long time ago in, in 2023, we decided, you know what, hey, I think I'm going to do what he said. We tell us not to eat certain foods. It's not about uh, anything other than, hey, he said it, so I'm going to do it. Amen? Why? Because his words are the words we got, are going to be held to account. He's the prophet, not just a prophet. Of all the, Hebrews in the, of all the heroes in the Bible, of all the faithful in the, in the faith chapter in Hebrews 11, of all the saints who will be rewarded, all of them moved first when they heard the voice of God. What did it say? It was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Why? Because when God spoke and said, get up out of this place, he called all of his servants in and said, break camp, we're going. Where are we going? I don't know. You've heard me say over and over again, Lord, I would at least just like to know right or left at the end of the driveway. I mean, it's a binary choice, right? Out of the driveway, right or left, which way am I going? When I, when I get to the end of my lane, which way am I going, right or left? I don't have to know where, but I ought to have some directions, right? Just imagine being in a, in a desert with no, no roads and no directions. Okay, Lord, which way? Which way? Which way do I go? He just, he just says he went. Yeah, which direction? That's what I would like to know. <clears throat> 
We use Hebrew roots because Jesus is Jewish. We say Hebrew prayers because Jesus is Jewish. Took a little criticism not too long back because they said these prayers aren't what I said they were. Okay, so I brought in the, the purple Messianic Siddur and showed everybody that the purple Messi Messianic Siddur, which is used in every Messianic congregation in the United States, says clearly these prayers date back to the early Second Temple period times. Okay, who's that? Who's early Second Temple? Haggai, Ezra, Nehemiah, Joshua the high priest. Not Joshua with Moses, but Joshua the high priest. These are people that God used. Who was over the Israelites at, at the time of the diaspora? Daniel. You're talking about some pretty big guys here. These are not just little rabbis saying, Oh, I think you should say this. These were great men of God who during the time in Babylon put together the form of, of religious worship that you see now. Now, they've modified it through the years, but hey, so have we, right? So the Christian church out here does not look like the one that Jesus started, does not look like the one the Apostle Paul raised up. Wow. So we want to point fingers at somebody else when we got our own house to clean up, amen? Didn't Jesus say that? I think Confucius said it too. Don't, don't fuss about snow on your neighbor's roof when your, yours is covered with snow. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I didn't say Jesus was Jewish. I said he is Jewish as in right now, resurrected. He's Jewish. Matthew 1, verse 1. This is the chronic, chron chronology of Jesus' stepfather, Joseph. <clears throat> Matthew 1, verse 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah the father, you notice we didn't go off to Ephraim. We didn't go to Joseph. We didn't go to Manasseh. You notice that, right? We went straight to Judah, father of all the Jews. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah whose mother was Tamar. Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father. So we're coming through the Perez line. We didn't go to the Zerah line. We're coming through the Perez line. Hezron the father of Ram. Ram the father of Amenadab. Amenadab the father of Nahashan. Nahashan the father of Salmon. Salmon the father of Boaz who you know from the story of Ruth whose mother was Rahav. Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, remember Rehoboam, the king that gave it all up, the father of Abijah, Abijah the father of Asa, Asa the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Jehoram, Jehoram the father of Isaiah, Isaiah the father of Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz, Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, the wicked king Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon the father of Josiah, the righteous king to restore it all, and uh, <clears throat> Josiah the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. So if you remember, we've talked about this before, Zedekiah, not listed. Jeconiah said, I'm going to take you as a signet ring off of my hand, but then he restores him later. Remember that story. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Remember Zerubbabel, the governor, right? Who was brought back to rebuild the temple with Agai's time. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud, Abihud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, Azor the father of Sadok, which should be T-S, not Z. Sadok, the father of Akim, Akim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eliezer, Eliezer, the father of Matan, Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Genealogy of Jesus through his stepfather, Joseph. Not much good to us because Jesus' father, the seed, the Holy Spirit that begat him, did not come from Joseph. Remember, if you go back in the story a little further, you're going to find out they never came together until Jesus was born. <clears throat> let's go to Luke chapter 3 and let's look at Mary's genealogy. Now, as it stands in modern Orthodox Judaism, 
a person is considered a Jew if they have a Jewish mother. Doesn't matter who the father is. Only matters who the mother is because anybody could have got her pregnant. That's, that's, you know, not exactly kosher thinking, but that's the way they do it. So if you got a Jewish mama, you're Jewish. There you go. If you got a Jewish daddy, maybe. Maybe. But if you got a Jewish mama, you're Jewish. Now let's look at this one. <clears throat> Verse 23, now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, son of Heli, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai. See, this is not the same genealogy, is it? This ain't the one we got in Matthew. <clears throat> the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Is Isli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maat, the son of Matthias, the son of Samin, the son of Josek, the son of Jodah, the son of Jonana, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel. Oh, so we're still coming through the line of Zerubbabel, though, right? But not entirely, because it doesn't go back to the kings. The son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kosam, the son of El Madam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer. What if that was the Joshua, the priest that, that is talked about in the one? The son of Joram, I guess not. The son of Matat, the son of Levi, son of Simeon, the son of Judah, son of Joseph, son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Melea, the son of Mena, the son of Matat. Ty, the son of Nathan, Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse. So now we're back into the line, and we're coming all the way back to. But you can see that the genealogies break off because Mary's line from David goes to Nathan and goes a different way. Nonetheless, Jesus, through his mother Mary, is of the kingly line, and he's Jewish Straight up, he's Jewish. The stepfather was Jewish. Now, do you suppose that the Savior of all the world, that two Jewish parents raised him Episcopalian? He lived in the Jewish quarter of Alexandria when they lived in Egypt. You, you realize there were more Jews at one time in Egypt than there were Egyptians. In the Hellenistic Empire, Alexandria had more Jews than Judah. Because with all the wars, they just went down to Alexandria, and it was just a huge Jewish city. That's why the Septuagint was written in Alexandria. And all the sages that came together that put all that, they were all in Alexandria. They weren't up in the Holy Land. A lot of folks don't know all that history. And then he lived in the Jewish city of Nazareth. Now, do you think that being Jews, they thought Jesus should be raised a Presbyterian? Now, I was raised a Presbyterian, but I don't think Jesus' Jewish parents in a Jewish village of Nazareth or in the Jewish city of Alexandria, because he was like, what, 12 when they brought him up out of there, raised him differently than the Jews around him, meaning he went to the local Jewish synagogue and he went through the service the same as they did. Now, maybe the Kabbalah Shabbat service that they do on Arab Shabbat was a little different, but the prayers we extracted were are used in the temple every week here, but they were also used back to that time. So did that temple use the same ones every single week that we use? I don't know, but it's pretty likely it's not like an impossibility. It's not like it's unlikely. It's very likely. Now, Paul was a Pharisee's Pharisee. <clears throat> Paul is who God used, who Jesus used, to set up the New Testament church. And since he was a Pharisee, he set it up like the Pharisaical system. All right, we don't want to be Pharisees. Well, too late. You're way too late for that. Paul set you up like Pharisees. You have local congregations to which there is a minister who teaches you. That's the Pharisaical system. Oh, we're not Jewish. Well, you really are. Whether you like it or not, you're following that. It's in every church in America, even though we want to talk bad about our Jewish neighbors. You know, they had a commercial out. 
and it, it, the commercial it talks about how Hitler was right is put on the internet 70,000 times a year. And so the dad's in the truck, it's raining, and he's jumping on his son for having put this on his social media. And he says, I raised you better than that. I can't believe you did that. And then they're in front of a Jewish temple and the people start coming out after service. He said, if you got something to say, you get out of this truck and walk over there and say it to their face. And the kid can't do it. Family's coming out. They're all happy and smiling. And they've been to temple. They had a good service. They're going to go eat lunch like the rest of us do after service. And, 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 and he can't do it. So the father puts his hand on the, on the son, you know, and that's the end of the commercial. But it's a very powerful commercial. Why all the hatred? Why all the vitriol for Jewish people? I met in their basement for 21 years. I never saw them do anything that was mean, ugly, out of place. No one ever said anything ugly to me as a Christian. They asked me to cover, you know, turn my banners over sometimes because the Yeshua's Lord maybe is a little provocative for their social hall. They didn't tell me to take it out of there. Look how many times we did things together with them. At any time, did anybody give you a hard time of all those years we met in the temple? They coming and going, and, and is it okay, and we don't want to disturb you? You know, one of the reasons they were sad, I mean, they didn't say it, I figured it out later. One reason they were sad we left is because they don't want to rent to anybody who's hostile to them, and we were one of the best friends the congregation ever had. So they like renting to us because we liked them. I do like them. They're great folks. I go back a long way with them. So, for all this, Jesus ate Jewish food. Maybe not the stuff they brought out of the diaspora in Eastern Europe. He's in, he's in the Holy Land after all, right? But he ate Jewish food. He played Jewish games. He celebrated Jewish holidays. You think? He went to the little Jewish synagogue in his hometown. There's only like... I forget how many houses. I mean, um, Ray Vanderlaan did the study, and he actually went to the ruins. They have, like, the little foundations lined out there in the village. There may be five houses, maybe six. A little small synagogue where they probably would have had a Torah scroll, not much different than the one we got over here. And they would have sat down and read a Parsha. The Parsha goes way back. They would have read a Parsha, maybe not the Parsha we have, but they had, they had a portion or a Parsha of the Torah that would be read every week. This is post-Antiochus, so they would have had the Haftorah, which is a, a piece of the prophets, a portion of the prophets that reminded them of the Parsha. See, the Parsha goes back before Antiochus. So they would have done all of that. And they would have eaten. They would have had the challah bread. They would have had the wine. They would have said the Baruchah. They'd have come back the next day for deeper study. Afterwards, the kids would have been playing games out in the yard and while the people talked and fellowshiped. And the same way of life we live as Sabbath keepers, Yeshua did that. He spoke Hebrew. And obviously the Nazareth slang version, because they said, oh, your, your, your dialect, your, um, your accent betrays you. He, it, he was not like we are in anglicized America. And it shows in his ministry. Let's go to John 4 and verse 9. It showed in his ministry. No one ever confused him for anybody else. Are you Greek? I want some euros. Nobody asked him for the tzatziki sauce. Even though I love tzatziki sauce. Believe me, I really do love that stuff. I could drink it in, out of a bottle. But anyway. John 4 and verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew! First observation the woman makes, he's a Jew! She didn't think he was a traitor. She didn't think he was a, I mean, traitor, T-R-A-D-E-R. She didn't think he was a Roman. She didn't think he was a Greek. She didn't think he was a Hellenized Jew. She said, You're a Jew! He, it was obvious from just sight that he's a Jew in his time. This woman easily recognized him. I mean, he didn't, did, he, did he correct her? Did he correct her? He didn't say anything about his Jewishness. Matthew 9, verse 20. He didn't say a word about that. He didn't say, no, 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 I'm not Jewish. He never denied it. He's probably quite proud of it. 
definitely people on earth in his time that weren't paganized. All, all of, all of the jo tribe of Joseph was paganized in the time of Jesus. The only tribe that's got their act together was Judah. So Matthew 9, verse 20, that just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind Jesus and touched the edge of his cloak. That ain't what happened, guys. That's your English mistranslation. She grabbed the chronapsidon. I get that wrong. I say it wrong sometimes. Craspidon. She grabbed the craspidon. This is it. The zeet zeet. She grabbed the zeet zeet. That's a Greek word for coils. She grabbed the zeet zeet. It's translated tassel. Tassels five times, that word. It was a well-known legend of Jesus' day that the tassels on the prayer shawl of a righteous man had healing power. It's the sole basis for the Apostle Paul sending out anointing cloths. So we don't mind anointing cloths in the Christian church, but it comes from this garment, a tallit, a Jewish prayer shawl. Oh, so we'll cut the tallit out. That means your anointing cloths don't have any power anymore because you just cut out the Bible that made it so. Can't do that. Keep the Bible. Non-Jews don't wear tallits. Till now. Till now in the Messianic church age, non-Jews don't wear tallits. Matter of fact, I'll never forget when I first started talking about it. You know, they, they, they were kind of surprised we did that. Why are you doing our stuff? We don't even do our stuff. Why are you doing our stuff? I said, your stuff is the stuff. Their stuff is the stuff. I'll never forget one time I, I bought a real nice one at Bill Cloud's, one of Bill Cloud's conferences, a real nice silk one. Y'all remember the blue one Miss Lanice used to have? It's kind of wore out now. And one of the temple members saw her in it, and he goes, that's a really nice talus. Well, I didn't know what that meant. I thought he was talking about a talisman or something. You know, I didn't know what talisman meant. Years later, you find out that's, a, that's an Ashkenazi way to say tallit. So I dropped it on a Jewish friend sometime later, and it, hey, where'd you learn that? You're not supposed to know that. <laughs> but, I mean, they don't explain everything. They just use the language, right? Hebrews chapter 7. Jesus is Jewish. Hebrews 7, verse 11. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the law was given to the people, why was there still a need for another priest to come? One in the order, uh, look, this is not correct. You see Melchizedek here? That's two words, Melech Sedok, king of righteousness, Melech Zadok. You know why it's mistranslated? Because somebody back in the 1400s was too proud to walk over to the synagogue and ask them what that was. That's why you get a lot of mistranslations in your Bible. See, back in the day when they were making the English versions of these Bibles in the 14 and 1500s, they were anti-Semitic. And I'm thinking to myself the whole time I'm reading the stories and watching all this, oh yes, these great people, they, they got the Bible to you. Okay, I'm grateful for that. Amen? Because, I mean, there are people trying to kill him for that. I'm grateful. But why were you so hostile that you refused to walk over to that Jewish temple and just ask somebody? You're trying to translate Hebrew, and you don't know the first thing about Hebrew. Oh, yeah, we learned it from the Catholics. What do they know about Hebrew? They're busy trying to kill these people. They're behind, they're behind every purge that ever went on in, in Europe over there. Why don't you just go befriend the Jewish people and say, what does this mean? They'll tell you. You won't be writing weird stuff like Melchizedek in here when it's Melech Zadok. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of those in the Bible. Not in the order of Aaron. For where there's a change of the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. Now, I'm not even talking about the law, but I'm, we're laying a foundation here. He, that's Jesus, of whom these things are said, belong to a different tribe. Jesus is not a Levite. He didn't come from the tribe of Levi, and no one from that tribe, and he's about to make it clear that it's Judah, has ever served at the altar. So Jews didn't serve at the altar, only Levites served at the altar. Now, when the northern tribes kicked the Levites out, a lot of them went to Judah, and so now, in modern terminology, the tribe of Levi, half the tribe of Dan, and all of the tribe of Judah are just called Jews because they all came from the southern kingdom. But we're talking about the individual family, the individual tribe, 
from whom our Lord is descended. <clears throat> Verse 14, for it's clear that our Lord, is Jesus your Lord? Is Jesus your Lord? I hope he is. Descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. So here Jesus is Jewish. If Jews, if the Jesus you serve did not come from the tribe of Judah, then he's not your Melech Sedok. If it, it, there's only one Messiah, he's Jewish. If your Messiah ain't Jewish, then I don't know where he comes from, but he ain't going to save you. Because the only Savior that was given to mankind chose to be born a Jew and he chose to be a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi who taught Judaism in the first century. Had an interesting discussion with one of my Jewish friends. And he goes, I think Jesus just came to restore Judaism to its earlier form without the money and the politics. I wrote him back, bingo, exactly. We're on the same page. We totally agree. We totally agree. You know, they spoke in tongues in the Old Testament, right? A lot of people forget that, but you go back and you study the school of the prophets. They prophesied. That Hebrew word for prophecy is nabi. It's a verb when you do it. It's a noun when it's the person doing it. It's an ecstatic utterance in the Holy Spirit. You give an ecstatic utterance that you don't know what you're saying. They spoke in tongues in the Old Testament. It's not a different religion. But now we have a Savior who can plug us back into the family from outside of our disobedient life. We disobeyed. We went outside the family. Over and over again in the law, it says if you break this commandment, you'll be cut off from your people. And we were. We broke all those and we were cut off. In our Jewish Messiah, we can be grafted back in. Restored from our previous um, estrangement from the God of Israel. You know, the only, the only God that's real is the God of Israel. You know that, right? The God of Israel is the only real God. Jesus is the God of Israel. So when he puts us back in, we're back in. That's not back in to keep sinning. That's back in now to start doing the things I'm supposed to. Restored so I can start behaving well. <clears throat> so the men of Judah are Jews. First time that word is used in the Bible, it's in that word we talked about last week between Abijah and uh, Jeroboam. They derisively called the men of the southern kingdom Jews. It's in your Bible. You can look at it. If you've got a King James, it's only in the King James. <clears throat> Jesus wore a tallit. Woman, gra woman grabbed these, right? There's more to it than just these. In Malachi, I'm not going to go to that prophecy. I don't think I'm going. It says wings, healing in his wings. This is the wing. It's called a kanaf. So the little square with the blessing on it and, and the zit zit, that's the wing. It's a kanaf. He'll have healing in his wings. You can't have healing in your wings if you don't have a tallit. You know, this is not rocket science. This is not, not, not big leaps of faith. This is not some far out thing. you got to look up here and dig in some obscure verse. This is straight out front. Open, Peshat, uh, literal, literal meaning of the words. So let me ask you a question. If it's good enough for the Son of God, the coming King of kings and Lord of lords, is it good enough for you? See, because some people balk on this. It's good enough for me, I'll tell you that. So let me ask you a question. In Torah, Torah, didn't mean to say it incorrectly. So I got a good friend who corrects me on that, but it's okay, I love her. Does the husband inherit from the wife's family or does the wife's family inherit from the husband's family? It explains a lot in the Bible if you understand that. Romans 8, verse 16. If you pull Torah out, none of the New Testament makes sense. If you don't understand the rules in the first five books of the Bible, none of the New Testament makes sense to you. They just, they're, just, they're just fluff words. But when you understand the Old Testament and you understand the Torah and you understand how God laid it down, then these are not fluff words. These are power. Makes the Old Testament come alive. Romans 8 and verse 16. 
the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. Now, if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, or we may also share in his glory. The wife inherits with the husband's family. That means you inherit with Jesus. We're co-heirs with Christ because we're the bride. Bridesmaids do not inherit. It's the bride who inherits. Bridesmaids aren't part of the family. The bride married in. So the bride inherits with the husband. So I'm going to ask you, are you a part of the bride of Christ? Okay, it's, it's okay if you're not. Not everybody is. It's okay. But if you're a part, then this matters. Are you a spectator? Spectators go back to their business when the wedding's over. Participants are changed forever. That is, people who get married are now in an irrevocable union. Did a series of messages. Marriage is serious. You're not supposed to change out. You get married once. That's supposed to be till the end of life. Do wives give their names to their husbands? Or do wives take the husband's name? Now, I know we got a lot of young millennials, and they're all woke, and they don't want to do that, but... Throughout history, from Adam and Eve to now, wives have taken their husband's name. So when I marry Messiah, I'm taking his name. He's not taking my name. His new name is not going to be Schultz, and neither is my new name going to be Schultz. My new name is going to be his new name because I'm marrying into the family. He's not going to become a German. Amen? <laughs> Trust me on that. That's, that's, just, that's just true as the sunrise in the morning. Jesus is not going to become a German because I'm getting married. I'm going to become Jewish because I'm getting married. Amen? My new name will be his new name. Revelation 3 and verse 12. Talking about Revelation chapter 3 in uh, Corinth this morning. Revelation 3 is the... This part of the letter is the letter to the Philadelphia Church of God. I'm happy to be a part of the Philadelphia era of the Church of God. I was saved in it. I teach from it. And I'm not going to quit. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So verse 12. To him who overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God. And the name, <clears throat> excuse me, in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven for, from my God, and I will also write on him my new name. So I'm getting married, and I get the name of God, the name of the city of God, and Jesus' new name. I'm not looking to change that, by the way. <clears throat> we get the family name. We get to become like him. Do you want to know how it's going to go in the future over these Jewish things? Let's go to Zechariah chapter 8. The future. Maybe this war, this war in Zechariah is starting now. I think it is. I'm, no, don't, don't say Pastor Bill said this is that. Just my opinion, but I think it's starting now. I think we're to the end. You know, I found it. I, when, when the Lord gave me the title, the time is now in June for trumpets, well, this is not good. This is not good. Have you noticed since trumpets, things have taken a wild turn in, in world events. Yeah. Zechariah 8, verse 23. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten men from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the zeet zeet and say, let us go with you because we've heard that God is with you. By the zeet zeet. So the Gentile nations are going to turn to the Jews and embrace Jewish things. All because of the Jewish Messiah. And this is the way the God of all the earth wants it. He gave all these things to Israel by his servant Moshe. He wants them to be used by his bride because they're his intimate personal things. And he's serious about it. Now you can argue with him if you want to, but I'm going to tell you he's going to have his way. Malachi 4. A couple pages over. Malachi, real short book. Let's start in verse 4. <clears throat> Remember the law of my servant Moses. Oh, that's Moses' law. I'll do that. Okay, the true God is telling you, remember the law of his servant Moses, the decrees, the laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. Remember. 
All of those Jewish things are in the Torah. And God himself spoke of them all to Moshe. We're to remember. We're to practice. We're to make ready. We don't do that by running away. We do that by using. As it says in another place in the book of Hebrews, discerning right use. You're under grace so you can make the mistakes while you learn how to do it right. The word remember connotes action. It's an active verb word. One of its variants means male. It is not passive remembering. It's active doing. Remember the law I gave my servant Moses. Remember it. Participate in it. Practice it. Don't just remember that the first five books of the Bible are there. Live by them. Well, that includes the parts we don't like. Everybody's got a part they don't like. You just got to do it anyway. You just do what God says. Without, without regard or question. <clears throat> like the tallit, the shofar, the menorah, and the prayers. Everybody has something in Torah that sticks in their craw. If you're going to marry Jesus, then you got to get over it. Because he's the husband. He likes these things, and if we're going to please him, then we had better like them. Genesis 49. I talked earlier about the prophecy that Jacob made over his son Judah. You know, it includes, it includes the Messiah, right? Jacob 49, verse 8. <clears throat> Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies, and your father's sons will bow down to you. You're a lion's club, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lion is who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah. And that's a prophecy that even governs the United States and Great Britain because the royal house of England is descended from King David. Nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until it comes to Shiloh, or it says here, until it, he comes to, to whom it belongs and the obedience of nations is his. That's talking about the Messiah. The ruler's staff is going to come to Messiah. And when it does, the obedience of nations is going to be his. The Messiah is Jewish, equals Judah. All of the nations are going to obey him. Let's go to Revelation 5 and verse 5. Like I said before, if your Messiah is not Jewish, you don't have one. There's only one in the Bible. He's Jewish. No, actually, he's Jewish. We just read both genealogies at the beginning of the message. What if I have Jewish blood and German blood the way that we interact with Okay, I probably have no Jer Jewish blood, and I'm German, but we get grafted in through Messiah. So it doesn't matter your lineage. It only matters his lineage. His lineage has to be proven. The rest of us are all grafted in because we're taking his sacrifice for sin. So if, I've been walking this path for nine years, if you've been walking this path, you're in the family. You're, you're grafted in. You're grafted in. I'm just trying to establish his genealogy because people right now are becoming hostile toward the Jewish people. And that's illogical as it comes. There you go. Revelation 5 and verse 5. <clears throat> then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David. He is able to open the scroll in its seven seas. Judah means Jewish. He's the lion of Jewishness. Do we want to marry this person? I hope the answer for everybody is yes. Then we're going to get over it and we're going to please our husband. Amen? Do you want his things to be your things? See, the apostles understood this. Now, let's go to John chapter 14. He's going to say something right after the Passover. They understood this, and since we're anglicized, we read over it and we let it go. Good. Good. We're there all the time. <laughs> there may be a time we have to lock them, but... Yeah, yeah. But well, we're going to keep them open as long as we can. I can't say that we'll always keep them open. There you go. <clears throat> John 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. <clears throat> trust in God. Trust also in me. That's Yeshua. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, 
so that you also may be where I am. So this is talking about a Jew, this is words of a Jewish groom to his bride. I'm going to prepare the hoopah at my father's house, and when it's time for the wedding, I'm coming to get you to take you to the wedding. Everybody in first century understood those words, but we had, we're so far removed from all that, we don't understand those words. But this is right out of the Jewish wedding. Every apostle there understood they were marrying the Jewish Messiah. And he's gone away to make the wedding chamber ready. And he's going to come again when the father says it's time. Which obviously can't be real far off. Not even the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul of Tarsus, thought any different. He repeatedly made his defense to the Roman authorities that he was a member of a sect of Judaism. Acts 24. He never at any time said that Christianity was different from Judaism. You can look it up in the book of Acts. You can read everything the Apostle Paul said. He never ever said Christianity was different. He said, I am a follower of the traditions of my fathers according to a sect known as the way. Acts 24, verse 12. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone in the temple are stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city, and they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, this is Paul, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope in God as these men that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Paul publicly stated that he agreed with everything in the law, including the tallit, the shofar, the menorah, all these Jewish things that people don't like. He said he worshipped the God of our fathers. That was the first century way of saying, I'm Jewish. Of course he's Jewish. He's a Pharisee's Pharisee. Acts 26, verse 2. He makes this argument several times. King Agrippa, I co consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. So here he's being charged by the Jews with stirring up trouble, and he's saying, I am happy to, be, to have my case heard before you because you understand all of the Jewish things. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jews all know the way I've lived ever since I was a child. From the beginning of my life and in my own country and also in Jerusalem, they have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. <laughs> and now it's because of my hope and what God has promised our fathers that I'm on trial today. And this is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. O king, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On my authority of... On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. The way he lived ever since he was a child, he always lived as a Jew. His life as a Christian was no different than his life as a Jew, except that he wasn't persecuting Christians anymore. He still observed all the Jewish customs, and likely said all of the prayers. He was a Pharisee of the strictest sect of the Pharisees. Chapter 28, verse 22. <clears throat> he is in a new place. He's come to Rome and he said, but we want to hear what your views are. For we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. So the, the Roman Jews are asking him, we want to know what your views are, because everybody's talking against this sect. So Christianity is called a sect. A sect of what? A sect of Judaism. That is how Christianity started. That is how the bride of Christ will finish. The only question remains is, who wants to marry the Jewish Jesus? I want to thank you for watching today. We'll be back next week. we got uh, Deacon Chris Faulkner is going to be up. I'm sure he'll give you a great message, and I'll see you back in two weeks.